Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the National Black MBA Association's Wednesday webinar series. Before we get things started, I'd like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. Over on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the Q&A window to submit a question, which you can do at any time during today's event. Type your question in the small text box at the bottom, and when finished, click the Send button. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Nicole Warmly. She is the Director, Talent Branding and University Recruitment, and has been a talent acquisition leader with over 20 years of experience, with a proven track record of creating and developing high-performing teams, as well as diverse attraction strategies to advance business objectives and goals. Nicole currently has responsibility for leading Danaher's talent employment brand and university recruitment programs globally. She's charged with advancing the candidate value proposition and attraction strategy for the Danaher brand in the external marketplace. Prior to Danaher, Nicole led talent acquisition and university recruitment teams in organizations such as Campbell's Soup Company and Aramark Corporation, to name a few. Nicole takes great pride in being a people leader, coach, and mentor, and she feels privileged to work in a role in an organization where she gets to bring that to life every day. So with no further ado, it is my great pleasure to turn the audience over to you, Nicole, to get things started. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Don, for the introduction. Um, hello, all. Uh, again, Nicole Wormley, and I am delighted to be a part of the National um, Black MBA's webinar series. And um, today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about self-awareness and self-accountability. I will preface um, in advance of the talking you through the agenda that I do not profess to be a talent manager, a curriculum designer, um, if you will, but what I can bring to the conversation is a little bit about me, a little bit about my career journey, and what I like to call my, my journey towards self-awareness and self-accountability with some learnings and some experiences and hopefully some, some lessons and learnings and tools that many of you will be able to take with you um, to the road to your discovery in this space. Um, so over the course of our time this hour, um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, tell you a little bit about the career trajectory um, and what I like to call the stages of self-awareness and self-accountability, what are some of those lessons along the way, and then most importantly, some summary of some key learnings that might translate into call to action for many of you on the line. And speaking of call to actions, I'm going to leave probably about 10 to 15 minutes on the tail end of the call in the event that there are questions. Um, so what I would encourage you to do, um, you have the ability to document your questions on your end. You also have the ability to document your questions during the course of the platform tool. And again, we will, I will provide you with the content leading up to that point, and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as we can during the Q&A period on the tail end of the call. So we will get started. So a little bit about um, the goal of the session. So when I was tasked with presenting on one of the webinar series, I thought what might be a topic that hadn't been previously presented and what might be a value add to the membership um, in advance of the conference itself and just in general. And I thought about self-awareness and self-accountability, and I won't necessarily read all of this in detail, but these two are critical components of any successful associate employee as well as anyone that is an existing and or aspiring leader. And again, I'm going to be telling you a little bit of the, the lessons and the journey through my lens, through my perspective, but I would argue that many of the things that we're going to talk about are things that you could um, find applicable to your work and or to your journey. You'll hear a little bit from me. Um, to Don's point, I've been in the wonderful world of talent acquisition for a few years now. So, again, I'm hoping that some of the resources that I can bring to the conversation will help many of you and or members of your extended colleague network and or teams. So about me, um, again, I've been in, in the wonderful world of talent acquisition for actually about 24 years now. Um, I am a proud product of the Philadelphia um, region, and I went to an all-girls high school. It's called the Philadelphia High School for Girls. I, um, from there, matriculated into uh, Millsville University, which is a fairly small liberal arts college um, in sort of central Pennsylvania. Um, and since graduating from Millsville, I've been 
a recruiter. And I like to say I'm a recruiter at my core, whether I'm recruiting early career students, whether I'm recruiting experienced professionals, I'm a recruiter. Um, and I've been doing that in some way, shape, or form. Some of the logos on this page are reflective of the companies that I've had the opportunity to do that work at. Um, I worked in the agency space. I worked at the Philadelphia Zoo, worked at Aramark Corporation, Campbell Soup Company, and then most recently, to Don's introduction, I'm with uh, Danaher Corporation leading talent branding and university recruitment. And when I think about the goal of the session, when I think about the career trajectory as it relates specifically to self-awareness and self-accountability, there are, there are six key stages that we're going to talk through over the course of um, our time today, um, they, those being unaware, uh, informed and operational, self-aware, reassess, self-aware and self-accountable, and reassess. From my career trajectory, these are the stages that I'm going to talk about that help me get to the point of what I call realizing my self-awareness and my self-accountability during the course of my career trajectory. So first off, when you think about um, the road to self-awareness and self-accountability, my story, zero to three years out, um, I love caricatures. So that is Nicole, um, after she matriculated from her um, from college, zero to three years of experience. Um, when you think about the theme of the session, Nicole was pretty much unaware at that point. I was confident. I was a college graduate. I had all of this excitement, and there was an enormous amount of things that I thought I knew because I was, I was a college graduate and I was going to take over the world. But when you think about being self-aware and you think about self-accountability, I only knew what my environment, I only knew what my experiences, and I only knew what I had learned in the classroom. Uh, translation, I didn't, I wasn't very self-aware. I wasn't, I didn't quite understand the concept of accountability much at all. So when you think about this stage of my professional career, um, I didn't know what I didn't know, but, you know, life has a way and experiences and the professional working world has a way of bringing those things to life for you. So when I think about that stage of my career and what I learned relative to self-awareness and accountability, it's a couple of things. One, while I was a college graduate, there were a whole lot of college graduates in the space that I was working in, and there were others that were significantly smarter than me um, because in my world, in my lens, I was ready to take over the world, but I quickly realized that that was not something that was going to be accomplished the day after I matriculated and started my first full-time position. Um, what I also learned is that following is tough. I was ready to take over the world, but I couldn't do that as an individual contributor in an environment with established processes. So there was a lot that I learned about me, the early career recent higher graduate that, again, was ready to do so many things, but life and experiences and my first job taught me that it wasn't going to be as easy as I thought it was going to be. So when you think about the self-awareness associated with that, um, not an easy thing to do. Um, the third learning here, um, my way was not always the right way. No matter how smart, no matter how intelligent, no matter how uh, how much I thought that that was the right thing to do, collaborating with others and allowing not only my voice to be heard, but allowing other voices to be heard and me receiving them was a part of this unawareness piece. And lastly, construction, constructive feedback was tough. You know, that was the first, one of the first times that I, I learned the process around performance evaluations. I learned the process around feedback and having your peers, having your leader, having your colleagues provide that to you. So when you think about that recent college graduate that early in your career, it's a tough thing to acknowledge that there are some things that I don't know about myself. There are some things about assimilating to an organization that is different than what I thought it was going to be. So when you think about all of those things, self-awareness, it was great, obviously, that all of those things occurred because it made me a little bit more sensitive to what I brought to the table. It made me a little bit more sensitive that others were bringing just as much, if not more, to the table because in many cases they had significant amount of experiences and that I needed to receive feedback in the manner in which it was intended. So that is my stage, my first stage of learning when you think about self-awareness. The second stage is what I call, what I like to call informed 
but not purely operational. So my second caricature, she's a little bit more polished, a little bit more professional. She's taken off her, her college graduate role. Um, she's done a little bit of professional development, and now I'm at a place where I have done the Myers-Briggs assessments, and I was an ENTJ. So I was aware of all the wonderful experiences that I had to date. I had taken an assessment, so I now had a little bit of an inventory of those things that I either did really well or that were watch outs and or that were opportunities. So again, I thought I was ready to take on that next opportunity, that next piece of the world. Um, I like to describe that stage as I knew enough to be dangerous about my learnings the last couple of years, so I was informed, but I hadn't really understood how you could operationalize that. So the lessons, when I think about self-awareness um, and self-accountability at this stage of my professional journey, um, it's a couple of things. Personality assessments provide awareness, but awareness without actions is not going to move the needle. So I had all these things that I now knew or that were documented about me, but I hadn't really put them into practice. I hadn't really operationalized them when I thought about how was this going to help me be a better me? How was this going to help me be a better contributor? So there was an element of taking my self-awareness to the next level, operationalizing it, that just knowing that I was an ENTJ was great, but then how was, how, how was I going to embed that into my performance objectives and plans? The second big learning from a self-awareness is how you see yourself is not always how others see you. So what I learned during the course of this stage that operationalizing is taking the feedback that you get from many of these performance assessment or personality assessments and asking others, you know, is this how you see me? Is this how I'm showing up? Are there things that I could be doing more, better, and or less? Because, again, I thought I knew enough about myself because I was aware. I had these assessment evaluations but I didn't necessarily know how that was showing up on um, others, which leads me to the third concept of intent versus perception. I could have had the very, very best intent, but how it was received by others is also a part of this self-awareness journey. So again, I would highly, highly recommend and encourage as you go through your journey, as you go through your stages of being informed and operationalizing things, how you want to take those assessments about who you are and how you show up and put them into practice and leverage others to see how that is showing up from their perspective, not just about how you intend to deliver a message or to intend to facilitate a meeting, how is it going to be received by those that you are doing that with. Um, the, the, the fourth learning in this, um, this second stage is what I like to call the annual performance plan process. Um, and I learned the power of not just having great goals that are going to be aligned to your actual job, but you should also have them aligned to your performance goals and objectives, the same way that you hold yourselves accountable to your business imperative and 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 sort of moving the needle with regards to the day-to-day -day jobs. How are you going to move the needle with regards to improving and or your awareness and or your accountability? So what could you do during the course of your performance objectives and plans to hold yourself accountable to being a better you? So making sure that those lessons and those awareness and those things that you learn about yourself, how are you going to make sure that you are taking those strengths and accelerating those strengths? How are you going to ensure that you can take those opportunities and build out experiences and or classes and or coaching and or access that's going to help maybe not have that opportunity be as much of an opportunity or put that opportunity into maybe um, more along the strengths category? So that is what I call the, the summary of my learnings from stage two around self-awareness, if you will. And then the stage three, you becoming, you know, fully self-aware. And again, totally Nicole's perspective. I'm now at a place where I'm aware of my my Myers Briggs. I now have the family dynamic. I now have, you know, balanced things to consider. So how do you balance the wonderful world of being, you know aware and acknowledging and working on both your performance and your development plans and holding yourself accountable to all the things that you said you were going to do over the course of that year and then balancing on the home front. It is not an easy thing to do, but it is absolutely something that you can do. You just have to create a plan. You have to draft out those things that are going to be important to you so that not only are you aware of those strengths and or those opportunities that are going to provide awareness, you are figuring out a way to balance those things and bring it into work in a way that your colleagues, your leaders, and your teams are also aware of those things that are that are part of who you are and how you show up at work so that you're not compromising home and or work and or personal in some way, shape, or form. 
So the Sage 3 learnings for me around the self-awareness piece is transparency is okay. It is it is absolutely all right for you to be able to wear, within reason, to be able to wear those things that are going to be important to you and your awareness, and people be okay with knowing that you're comfortable being transparent because what you are doing is you're showing that it is okay to share here is who I am. This is what I bring to the table. Here is an opportunity that I know it that I'm working on because you create a culture and an environment where it becomes safe. Um, and being vulnerable along those same lines around transparency is okay. It shows that we're all human. It is not a bad thing to be transparent and or to be vulnerable. And you have to figure out what is the right environment and how do you want to position it. But it just helps during the course of your journey to self-awareness and self-accountability. Everyone has things that they're working on, which is the another learning here. So when you think about being transparent and being vulnerable within yourself, everyone has those things that are a part of their, their career trajectory, how they show up at work, how they show up after work, um, how they show up personally. Um, so it's okay. It is absolutely okay. One of the things that I would also recommend is, you know, get a pulse on your organization. Understand culturally what are those things that are the norms relative to transparency and vulnerability because you don't want to go at the opposite end of the spectrum of what your organization's culture is. So leverage leaders, leverage mentors within your organization to help define when you think about being self-aware, what level of transparency is culturally okay, what level of transparency might push the needle a bit, what level of vulnerability is okay, and what level might push the needle a bit so that you are comfortable being self-aware, but you're also being very, very thoughtful about the cultural nuances within your organization. Um, sharing strengths and opportunities, invite others, particularly members of your team and or your colleagues, into doing the same. And what that ultimately does is it creates an environment where you can share. It's okay to have an opportunity. Um, everyone has lessons. Everyone has opportunities. Everyone has strengths. One of the things that I found, and I think I speak to it a little bit later, is I'm at, I was at a place where I was, be, I was a bit self-aware, and I had done from the Myers-Briggs, I've done a, a few other personalities. I've done things like 360s and 180s to get after some of the self-awareness and the accountability piece. And um, I started surrounding myself with people that had strengths that were where, where I had opportunities. So there are some very, very creative things that you can do to be able to build your network so that your, your self-awareness is very strategic about how you're solving for some of your opportunities. And then last but not least, from a self-aware perspective, um, there are lessons there are lessons in mistakes. There are lessons in failures. Self-reflect, you know, turn that mirror around and identify what could I have done differently? What about this situation was the root cause of this problem? Um, where might there be lessons and or opportunities and or solutioning that if I am faced with this situation again, I might be able to be a little bit more proactive on the front end of that mistake or the front end of that failure so that you don't do that again. Um, so highly recommend. The lesson here is, you know, own it, learn from it, and move on. So the, the fourth stage is what I like to call reassess. Um, and I was at a stage probably about 12 years, 12, maybe 15 years into my career, and I, one of the best pieces of advice that an HR leader and partner provided to me was, you're doing really, really well. Um, the feedback is going great. You strengths, opportunities, self-aware, owning and being accountable for your actions. But let's take it a step further and assess you again. Um, we change, our needs change, the, name, the needs of our organization change, and sometimes even your assessment levels will change. So we did a very, very deliberate reassessment of myself, um, myself as a leader, myself as a people leader, myself as a colleague, peer, influencer, as well as employee. And at this time, um, you know, I was influencing without formal authority. I was balancing still home. I was bringing people along this journey with me, but it doesn't stop. So the, the, the point around stage four is once you think you've got it figured out, reassess yourself again, reassess your team, reassess your organization, because oftentimes, again, that reality versus perception, you don't want to become too comfortable with who you are, that you have, you've sort of let your, your, your strengths become sort of the norm, you've become, let your opportunities become a norm, because as you move up and or over and or around within your organization or within other organizations, it creates an opportunity potentially for you to have different types of strengths or need to have different types of strengths or different types of opportunities. 
So again, this reassess, I've changed my emoji a bit because I've, I've shifted a bit. Um, so key learnings for me during this reassessment process is when I was doing really, really well was when I went through this reassessment process. And I thought, why do I need to do this? I'm doing good, right? But I learned the power that feedback is absolutely a gift. Um, and to be proud of both my strengths as well as an opportunities because everyone has that. Accepting responsibility um, gets easier every time you do it. So where there are those failures or those missed opportunities, own it, learn from it, and move on. Um, but it becomes easier as you continue to, to grow and you, you get to a journey of doing a little bit more in this space. Um, team members learn from and follow their leaders. So if we are resistant as leaders to be a part of this transformation, this transparency, and have moments of vulnerability, we are teaching the next generation to do that very same thing. So create an environment where it's okay to express yourself freely without judgment um, because it's about solutioning and it's about transparency. Um, excuses build monuments of nothingness. <laughs> um, oftentimes we find ourselves making excuses for what we could have done or what someone else would have done. Nah, I say, you know, again, make it, make it fact-based, turn that mirror around and assess what we could have done differently. And if there's an opportunity to turn the mirror at others, that's fact-based. Abs absolutely do that, but be thoughtful about the why, not just making excuses for, for your and or their behavior. And the very last bullet, I bullet I sort of spoke to, but creating an environment where discovery, awareness, and accountability are safe. Are safe. And again, the, the stage around stage four is one that I'll revisit again, and I'll tell you why. But that reassessment piece is absolutely key. I highly recommend when you think about where you are, when you think about becoming comfortable and complacent. Sometimes that's a great opportunity to re-energize yourself with assessments, with trend finders, with discs things of that nature, um, as well as a, a 180 or a 360 to help you um, sort of reassess is where you were three, four years ago is where you are now. Oftentimes you will see some shifts and or changes based upon your level of influence and or impact within your organizations. So the, the self-awareness and the self-accountability piece. So, you know, I migrate to, um, to the stage five because once you have done that reassess and you're even more self-aware than you were prior, you're even more self-accountable, you still have all those factors at the very, very bottom of this slide, whether for me it's, it, you know, it's faith, it's family, it's spouse, it's balancing home, it's all of the things that you, you, that become a part of who you are that bring, that you bring with you to your teams, to your environment, to your mentor network, to your mentee network, all of those things help contribute to that element of self-awareness and self-accountability. And there are more people counting on you. There are organizations counting on you. So that ability to be able to be able to say, this is who I am, authentically who I am and who I'm going to bring into work every day is absolutely something that we all aspire to be. I would say that once you get there, there's still an opportunity to do more. But this is the stage where I would say, you know, you get to a point where you have it and you feel comfortable with it. It's a great, great place to be, but it, there's always more to learn. There is always more to engage and, um, and be conscious of. So when you think about key learnings again, again, that feedback is still a gift for yourself as well as for others, but now you're at a place where you are spreading self-awareness to yourself as well as to your team. So how do you not only receive feedback, how do you give feedback in a way that people are going to be excited about the, the opportunity to receive it and use that as an opportunity to develop themselves? Model the behavior that you want to see in others relative to the self-awareness and the self-accountability, because again, it is much bigger than you as you matriculate up and or over within your career trajectory and journey. Um, surround yourself with people who have strengths where you have opportunities, and this is not just about titling. So there is a member of my team who is at the coordinator, um, administrator kind of level, but has the most wonderful um, wonderful attention to detail, and she I leverage her oftentimes. So it isn't about leverage this person who is two, three levels above me or have reached a certain rank for them to be able to leverage or partner up from a strength perspective. So don't get caught up in titles when you're leveraging other people to support you because there could be folks at your level, below your level, or above your level, or at your peer group that can serve as resources to you to help supplement where you have an opportunity. That also is the power of having a diverse and inclusive team, both thought, experience, and level diversity to help round you out and to help round out members of your team and or your broader, um, your broader organization. Meet people where they are um, and give yourself permission to do the same. 
So while we were at a place, where I was at a place at this stage where I am, you know, giving coaching counsel and being a little bit more aware and comfortable with where I am uh, from an awareness and accountability, and you want to give it to other people, but you also want to give yourself permission to fall off from time to time. You also want to give yourself permission to say, you know what, that didn't happen, and own it and move on. So while we are all looking to get to that place of, of self-awareness and self-accountability, give yourself permission to have a slip-up every now and again because we're human, and the same way that our team members and our colleagues would do the same. And again, I sort of alluded to this already, creating a safe space where there is vulnerability. So when I think about key learnings over the course of, again, in my career trajectory, these are just some of the things that I wanted to call out um, over the course of what I shared with you during my time here. One, um, again, it is okay to be unaware, but not for long. When I think about, again, that early career journey of what Nicole knew and or didn't know very, very early, very, very different than Nicole of today. So it is okay if you're early in your career trajectory to be on this learning journey to self-awareness, be on this learning journey of self-accountability. Personality assessments, and I listed a few here, um, they're a great, great starting point, but definitely supplement them with your 180s, your 360s, and things of that nature, because it always rounds out the experience. And one thing that I'll add is it's not an exact science, so you don't want to take an assessment and think, this is exactly my book, my Bible for self-awareness, because each one of the assessments and each one of the pieces of 360 feedback might tell you different things, but zone in on themes. Zone in on those things that you're rating very, very high or those things that you're rating very, very low that you have, you have vetted with others to say, this is something that I know is a strength, this is something that is an opportunity. So that's where, that's where you want to balance the assessments with the feedback with the, um, with the reality, because again, it's not always black and white. Feedback is a gift. I say I've been saying this maybe for about 10 years, and I absolutely believe it. So that is something that we always want to make sure that we are, we are being thoughtful about as we are receiving feedback. Um, bring all of who you are and who you aspire to be in life to your performance and your development plans. This is absolutely one that I highly recommend. If you do not have a formalized performance and development plan, I would highly recommend that you do so. If you do not have it documented and your leader is not aware, I would highly, highly recommend that you do so as well um, because it helps hold yourself accountable and it also helps create a sense of transparency with your leaders, with your teams, and vice versa. Not all paths are created equal. Um, the career trajectory and lessons for me might be very different than yourselves. Um, and, and, and and I would say that that also applies for members of your team and or organizations. Um, and I sort of alluded to this when we were at stage four, that reassessment process, because we change, always, always do a bit of a pulse check, whether it's every couple of years or as regularly scheduled as your organization may have in place. And if they don't, do it on your own end, because it is absolutely something that you want to make sure that you have a pulse on and that minimally your supervisor and your supervisor's supervisor is aware of where you have strengths, where you have desires, and where where there is opportunity so that you can continuously work on them. Um, own you and take responsibility for you. Ultimately, your ability to be self-aware, your ability to be self-accountable is your responsibility, and I think it is something that we all should should take part in and take full responsibility for and leverage mentors, leverage coaches to help bring that, to help bring you along those journeys. And that is um, where I, I sort of close with that reassessment process. The journey absolutely continues. So it may start with unawareness. It may start with mildly self-aware. It might start with your ability to just sort of start from ground zero and assess so that you can get to a point of self-awareness and self-accountability, but it doesn't stop. You know, I would argue that when you get to a place, again, of being aware or comfortable with your know, accepting responsibility and being accountable, start that process of reassessing yourself. Start the process of evaluating your team members and or your colleagues to help you um, with the next stage of your journey, the next stage of your career trajectory. Um, so that is that is my story. Um, I'm actually finished a little bit early, so I will open up the line to questions shortly. So again, um, Nicole Wormley with the wonderful world of, um, of Danaher, and this is just my take on um, you know self-awareness and self-accountability. So I hope the conversation um, provided some insights and some resources for each of you. Um, and at this point, I will open it up to questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nicole, for the excellent presentation. Here's a reminder for those of you in our audience, if you have a question, you can find the Q&A panel over on the right-hand side of your screen. 
right below Nicole's photograph. If you have a question to submit, you can type it in the small text box at the bottom, and when finished, click the Send button or push Enter. And we invite and encourage you to send in any questions you may have for Nicole. Again, use the Q&A panel over on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question in the small text box at the bottom. And when finished, please click the Send button or push enter. And we do have a question in the queue from an attendee who says they've taken Myers-Briggs Strength Finder uh, disc and a few other assessments. Can you recommend any tips or tools for finding ways to synthesize all that info given each is from a different perspective? Yes, I would um I would I would look at what are the similar themes within each one of them that you think resonates as at, resonates for you from a strength perspective as well as from an opportunity perspective. So I'll use myself as an example. So I've done all of them as well, and it, there are some themes around being a driver for me. There are some themes around influencing without formal authority. There are some themes around collaboration that I do really, really well. There are some themes around details, eh, not too much. Um, there are some themes around um, you know, sometimes navigating in a new environment that it takes me, it takes me a little bit of time or I may come in with a, with my own opinion that I have to, I have to pause a bit before making assumptions. So those themes resonated across all of those assessments for me. So it's a little bit of time and a little bit of effort, but look at those strength themes and look at those opportunity themes and then say, or if it's completely different, then that's maybe a whole nother conversation. But I've taken the approach to look at and focus on themes. All right. Very good. Thank you, Nicole. Our next question is, what is the best way to go about exploring different positions, career paths within a current company for growth opportunities, essentially discovering what's available? So I will take. I will answer this question two ways. If we are talking internally, I'm, I'm an existing employee within the organization, and I'm looking to explore what is available. One, I would I would leverage whatever internal job posting system that you have within your organization. If that does not exist, there should be an HR business partner or a talent acquisition manager leader within your business. I would absolutely tap one of them if there isn't a formalized system where you can access the jobs yourself to see what's readily available. Um, so I would start, that's my internal question, my internal answer. Externally, the beauty of the social and digital network, you have the benefit of the of a Google search to see what's available. You have the benefit of LinkedIn. You have the benefit of many job boards and Glassdoor to assess. So if it's internal, leverage your internal subject matter experts that manage jobs. If it's external, leverage all the wonderful tools and resources and database at your fingertips to get at what positions are available. Externally, you also have, well, I would argue you could also do this internally. You could search your internal LinkedIn, internal associates on LinkedIn and just reach out and ask for some time. Now, on the external side, you could maybe off, you could reach out to prospective company associate members and ask that they'd be willing to take some time to let you know how you could find out what jobs would be available. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Do you have any tips or ideas for establishing a mentorship relationship when one is already established in their career and or organization there's sometimes the belief that those that are established no longer need mentorship so i i'm glad you asked that question i would argue that everyone needs mentorship um my president and ceo spoke to our mba interns and he still has folks that he reach out to for mentorship. So I would argue that absolutely everyone needs it. Now, sometimes there are established mentoring program frameworks that are in existence within your organization. So if that is the case, absolutely explore how you could take part in, that or in, in the opportunity if it exists within your organization. If it does not, start paying attention to those people, those peers, those leaders that you aspire to be either like, whether it's operational-like, whether it's how they show up at meetings, whether it's how they present. So keep an eye out for those folks that you are impressed with during the course of your navigating your, your work within your organization and just have conversations with them. Schedule a time. You don't want to schedule a meeting and say, hey, I liked how you spoke and I'd love you to be my mentor. 
establish a relationship with someone to make sure that they are they are someone that you would be interested in having them forge a formal mentoring relationship with you. So seek out those people. Explore opportunities to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffee. Um, and then as you've had a couple of conversations, then you can ask, okay, I really enjoyed our conversation. I welcome the opportunity for us to have more of a, a regularly scheduled cadence translation mentor relationship so you can organically get there without asking someone the first time you meet them that you'd like for them to be your mentor but i again i'm great question i would highly recommend everyone have mentoring consider doing that not only inside your organization externally as well i probably have a board of mentors resources that i leverage from former companies my existing company but just as many that i have not worked with or is not in my industry so you could have a board of mentors that might meet your needs and or support you at different stages of your career all right in changing industries completely how would one go about best assessing ourselves for the best fit Changing industries uh, can have its challenges. Um, I would recommend leveraging the national conference to pressure test your your industry switch. So if you are in life sciences, like a dad or her company, if you're in life sciences and you're looking to make a industry switch to financial services, I would talk to every financial services organization at the conference, let them know your background, your experiences, why you're looking to make the shift, and um, and, and you want to get an initial reaction from them. So I would leverage the national co- – an example could be leveraging – all of that industry switch, those industry switch companies at the national conference to get an initial reaction. Um, if it's about switching functions within an organization, that one's a little bit easier because you could tap on the leaders within your existing employer to say, if it's I'm staying, I want to be in I'm in HR, but now I want to go to corporate finance. Have a lunch with the corporate finance leader at your existing company. Have a conversation with accountants and or financial analysts to understand what they do, how they do, and then you could figure out, do I do I have applicable experiences that I can make that transition easily, or are there gaps that I need to figure out how I fill it? All right, our next question. I've been told that it's necessary to have both a mentor and champion. Do you have both, or do you leverage one for both? So I'm not quite sure how you would define a champion. I have historically had mentors and sponsors. So a men- how I define the two mentor versus a sponsor, um, a sponsor is oftentimes that person that um, – So I had a a young lady that was a mentor that she evolved into being a sponsor. So she is a higher level, or was at the time, higher level in ranking and role and in influence. And how I leveraged her was sort of a sounding board, um, supporting me, I'd say maybe two, three times or so a year. But she was the person that was advocating for me when I wasn't in the room. The mentor is that person that I'm having fairly more regularly scheduled conversations with around either situations and or day-to-day and or performance and or review. So for me, it's a difference between mentoring, which is that a traditional mentor that I would leverage more in the, in the moment, the existing job, the existing situation. The sponsor is a little bit more high level, and ideally they have a little bit more influence and power that's advocating for me when I'm not in the room. So I hope that answers the, the question. Otherwise, you can elaborate on your concept around championing. All right, Nicole, that was the final question we have at the queue, in the queue right now. We'll allow a little more time for folks to queue up with any additional questions before I defer to you for closing thoughts. Again, you can find that Q&A window over on the right-hand side of your screen to submit your question. Type it in the small text box at the bottom, and when finished, click the Send button or push Enter. And that looks like that's all we have in the question queue now. Nicole, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap things up? No, I would just say thank you for taking the time to join the call. Um, Hopefully you will all be at the National Conference in Houston. Um, Myself as well as a dynamic team from Danaher will be there. So um, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to meet uh, formally. Um, But I invite any that might be looking for, whether it's student opportunities and or experience hiring, we will have a team of university recruitment um, professionals as well as uh, experienced talent acquisition and sourcing team members there to tell you all about who we are and the job opportunities that we have available. So hopefully this was good for everyone. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation, and hopefully I'll have the opportunity to meet some of you soon. 
All right. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Nicole, and thank you to our audience on behalf of NBMBAA for joining us today. This will conclude today's program. Again, thank you for attending, and we hope you have a nice day.